Hi, my name is Matt Morgan. I'm an application engineer for Go Engineer. Go Engineer has put on a few tips and tricks shows over the last few years, and recently we put on a show uh, showing some uh, tips and tricks on how to build some of the components of a small helicopter. I was asked to show a video of, how, of those steps uh, to illustrate what I did and some of the tips and tricks that I showed. So here goes. So I'm going to open a brand new part and just walk through the steps that I went through in the show. Uh, so I started with sketching on the top plane. So I just picked the top plane, start a sketch, I drew a couple of rectangles, small enough so I didn't ha they didn't change scale a lot when I started uh, adjusting them. So I just drew a couple of rectangles like this, and then draw a line up here at an angle, straight up. Although I drew this uh, like that. And then I used the trim command, and while on the trim command, I'm using the power trim, and I can just drag through these areas that I want to get rid of, and I can also extend, so I can click this line and pull it onto this line to close it off. Uh, then I drew in a couple of uh, center lines to help center this part. Uh, this one I wanted to be vertical, so the midpoint of this line was lined up with the origin, so I made that vertical. Uh, I wanted these two lines to be equal. I want this line to be lined up with this one. And I should be using some of the pop-up shortcuts instead. Uh, for example, if I pick these two points, I should have used that one. That's a little faster way to get to it. And then I threw on some dimensions. If I dimension from a point to a center line, remember if you drag to the other side, it goes to a doubled dimension. This is going to be half of it that I'm designing, so the other half will eventually be mirrored over here. So I want to show kind of the overall length by doubling that dimension. I'll make that 13. And then in 2013, or it might have even been 12 that started this, if I pick a second point, it remembers the center line that I used in the past and creates the same type of dimension. So that saves me a little time uh, not having to uh, reselect the center line again, especially if you're zoomed in and you can't see the center line again. Uh, that makes it easy to work with. And then I'll throw a, an angle dimension here. That's 45. We'll make this 2. And uh, these will be 2 and then the overall length was 20. Okay, so now I have the sketch completed. Uh, so now I'll just switch to an isometric view. I used Control 7 on the keyboard shortcuts to uh, get to an isometric view. You can also hit the space bar and just click on isometric view here. Uh, now, when you have Instant 3D on, which is on your feature toolbar, Instant 3D right here, if that's on, I can just double click to exit a sketch. So double click, the sketch closes. Now I can select it and also because of Instant 3D, I can, it puts an arrow on the sketch here, and I can just pull that down, drop that right on one millimeter for how thick we wanted this to be. Okay. Now the next step was going to be uh, to import a DWG. Uh, the storyline of this presentation was that we had an industrial designer that created a sketch of what they wanted the landing gear to look like, and we want to use that sketch. So basically what I did was pick this plane and uh, by hitting the S key on the keyboard, that pops up your shortcut toolbar. And it also puts your search right up here in the command search. It puts your cursor up there, so I can just start typing DWG. So you hit S, DWG, and that uses the command. I can just hit Enter to use that command uh, because I pre unselected the face. Let's do that again. So use the DWG command, hit Enter, and it will put it on this face. So I can just set my... my uh, file type to DWG, pick this landing gear DWG, and import it as a 2D sketch. Uh, we'll go ahead and use the dimensions that were used in the sketch, and we'll have it automatically add some constraints for me. I don't need to do anything else, so I'll hit finish. And that will place it, but uh, when you draw in 2D, you're not often concerned about where the origin is, so if I zoom to fit, you can see the, the landing gear is way out in space, the orig the parts down here. So if you'd simply close the sketch, this little 2D to 3D toolbar can be very helpful, especially if you have top, front, and right views and you want to fold those over. Uh, you can also check for uh, 2D to 3D conversions on our YouTube uh, channel if you go to YouTube slash GoEngineer. And, uh, you can watch 2D to 3D conversion to look at the glass box approach that these different buttons help you do. But in this case, I'm just going to pick this point and hit Align Sketch, and because the point is selected, uh, it puts that point on the origin. So it's a little different than how you would normally use that button in the 2D to 3D conversion, but in this case, it helps me uh, position that really well. So now I'll zoom into this feature here, 
and let me zoom in a little closer. And then I'll push, select it again, instant 3D. I'll pull the arrow. I'll drop it to one millimeter. Uh, just keep in mind that if you're off the ruler, it's going to snap to really small decimal places. But if you put your cursor right on the ruler, it'll snap right on to integer values that are in the ruler. So I can drop it on one. And I want to add draft to this. And right when you drop that, it pops up a little toolbar here that lets you add draft or turn it into a cut. So if it's an extrude, you can switch it to a cut. Uh, in this case, I'm going to add draft. Uh, that, that will actually help me in the future what I'm going to show you next because this edge is here, whereas if it was not drafted that would just be all one face along with this one. Uh, so that draft helped me uh, have an edge where I needed one here in the future. I'll show you that. So before we go into uh, moving this, I'll put a chamfer here. Uh, remember that right click is, has the option to switch distance distance so you don't have to go to the, the feature manager. So we'll switch to distance distance and then using this uh, flyout toolbar I can change uh, the dimensions to 2 and 3. Okay. And uh, let's see, I'm getting a little reflection here. I don't need any of that, so I'll turn off the shadows and reflections. And uh, let's, to, let's add a fillet. Let's just say a 0.75 millimeter fillet on a few of these areas here. And uh, I can just window select the edge, so I don't have to try to zoom in and pick that little edge. Uh, you can also use G on the keyboard for glass, and that pops up a magnifying glass, so you can select that way as well. I like the window select when I'm just picking little edges, as long as there's not a lot of other edges around that the window select would capture. So I'll apply that one, then I'll switch the radius to 5, and I'm using the fillet expert, so I can just apply and keep going on from there. So I'll window select this one, put 5, this one, and this one. And I forgot, this one back here is just a 0.752, so I'll select that one, go back and edit that and get, uh, get it like this. Okay, the next step is, since this is going to be a, a landing gear for a helicopter and the rest of it's going to be mirrored and we're going to have that on the other side, we, we want to pro provide a little more stability by rotating this out. So what we can do is use the move face command, and if you just right click on a face, you can go to move, and that gives us the option to offset, translate, or rotate faces. Uh, so because I right-clicked on a face, it already selected that face and put me into the option to rotate about what, or translate about what. Offset just offsets the distance, but translate or rotate require you to select a direction. So I'm going to say rotate around this edge, which is why I added the draft, so I have this edge here to pivot around. Otherwise, I'd have to draw some kind of sketch or something to, to give us that pivot point. As soon as I select that, it puts the, the selection back up into the uh, faces to move box and then pops up this little tool here that says, let me help you pick other things so you don't have to go pick every little filleted face around here. So I'm going to say pick all surrounding faces. So it picks everything that this face touches. And so the only thing left to pick is the other side. So that selects all the faces. Then I can specify a uh, amount of rotation. We'll say 30 degrees. We'll flip the direction. And uh, you can tell that uh, this would actually leave a hole in here if it were just rotating those faces, but SolidWorks is smart enough to extend that edge off and uh, keep, make sure it stays solid. Okay, So now that's rotated out, giving us a nice uh, wide base for the helicopter to land on. Uh, the next step was to create a, a series of holes in here that, that taper slowly getting larger to follow the taper of this edge here, and then one that's kind of bigger and, and not really following the pattern. Um, so we'll start by just drawing a hole. So I'm going to look straight onto this place, onto this face, and we'll add a circle. And then uh, one of the requirements was that all of the dimensions used in the, in the next step where I vary the pattern, uh, all of the dimensions had to be in the sketch. So uh, I couldn't dimension to this edge because this edge wasn't in the sketch. So what I did was I just copied this edge into the sketch and I just turned it into construction lines. That way all the dimensions are dimensioning to sketch objects. Um, I also wanted to dimension 10 millimeters from the point of this, but I have already put a chamfer and rounded the corner on here, but I want to have a, a dimension to the virtual sharp point. Uh, so that's no problem with SolidWorks if you pick this edge and this edge. I can add a sketch point. And when I have two edges pre-selected, when I click sketch point, which you can also put on your shortcut toolbar if you'd like, um, 
it puts a virtual sharp point. So pre-selecting two edges, then picking point adds a virtual sharp that is at the intersection automatically. So if these ever changed, that point is always going to be at the, the intersecting location. And when it's a virtual sharp, it changes the appearance to look like whatever your virtual sharp settings are in your document properties. So mine is set to ANSI standard, so it's creating these extension witness lines. So now I can go in and put the dimensions on. I want a two millimeter diameter. I want it two and a half millimeters off of this line that I copied. And then I want 10 millimeters from this virtual sharp point. Okay, so that locates the first hole. And then I'm going to I'm going to do a cut extrude. Uh, one little tip: if I escape out of that, you can also just double click to exit a sketch. Then your shortcut toolbar now has feature commands instead of sketch commands, and you can get right to your cut extrude that way. And you can also right click to change end conditions, so you don't have to move over into your feature manager again. So I'm going to say go through all, and then either right click to say OK or hit Enter to say OK. Next, I want to pattern it, but remember I mentioned the pattern needs to get, each hole needs to get larger, the spacing needs to get further apart, it needs to stay tapering so it stays close to the center of this. So what I'm going to do is use a linear pattern. I'll use that edge for the direction. We want five of them spaced five millimeters apart. So sorry, I said that backwards. Five millimeters, five times. Features to pattern will be our, our last cut right here. And then we're going to scroll to the very bottom and use instances to vary. And that allows us to vary each pattern instance. Uh, for example, this first one, this is your pattern spacing. I can say one millimeter. So that means each one of these gets one millimeter farther. So this one's five apart, that one's six apart, that one's seven, that one's eight. Then I can go into the next box down and say I also want to vary the diameter of the circle. And so let's make sure that box is highlighted when I pick it. Diameter of the circle. Good, so now that shows up in here. And then I can also pick this dimension. And this one's the one that required uh, the dimension to be to a sketch line, not to an edge. So that's why I converted this edge in, so I could pick that dimension in the pattern variation as well. So the, the diameter, we're going to vary by half a millimeter. So it gets half a millimeter larger each way, each pattern instance. And then the spacing off this bottom edge, the 2.5, we're going to vary by 0.15, and that will slide it up to give us a, a more centered uh, line. It may not be exact, but you can adjust as, as needed. Uh, and this last object, we want it to be a bigger circle right here in a different spot that's a little larger, further out, further offset from this line. So we can pick on the dot, and have, we have an option to modify that instance. If I modify that instance, I can say, Okay, the, the diameter needs to be 6, the spacing off the bottom needs to be 5, and then the total spacing from the first one will make 28. So that one can make this one just completely unique in size, dimension, and, and diameter, or uh, distance off of this edge. We can do all that in one pattern instance instead of having to sketch each one of these separately. We can just pattern it. Then we have a slot up here, so we're going to pick on this face and start a new sketch with the pop-up toolbar that happens automatically. And on the shortcut toolbar with the S key, uh, I have the slot command. I can't remember if that's on SolidWorks by default, but remember that you can always right-click on the shortcut toolbar and customize it and uh, drag whatever buttons you want. So uh, for that particular button, you could go to uh, the sketch tools and drag the, the slot. And this one's actually a flyout, actually, so let's go to... Uh, the flyout toolbars, and we can find the slot flyout, drag it on, that's how this was put on there. I can't remember if that was already there or not, but uh, now, while that's uh, on my toolbar, I can just select it. Uh, you can pick from multiple types of slots. Uh, that's what the flyout is good for, so I can pick multiple types. Uh, another little trick is if you picked, say you picked straight slot, but you want a center point slot, if you just hit A on the keyboard, it will toggle. You'll notice it toggling right here. It'll toggle between the other slot types. So just A on the keyboard is a toggle. And that's a default command. Unless you've changed A to something else, that's what you should, that's what the behavior should be if you hit A. So I'll draw a slot from the center. I'm going to draw a center line to the center point of this arc or this edge right here. And I'll make that vertical. And I missed that point, so let's make sure these are coincident. Okay, and then we'll finish it off with a few dimensions. I want that to be one, and then this, 
the slot size to be 1.5 by 10. Okay, and then again, I just double click to exit the sketch, hit the shortcut toolbar on the keyboard, which is S, cut extrude, right click through all, right click to enter to say OK. So a lot of things to just really improve the efficiency of your design just by using the right clicks, using the, the shortcut toolbars uh, to get those commands in. Now, we also need a little cylinder kind of landing pad uh, for this landing gear to land on. So what we're going to do is go to the right plane. This way, I don't actually have to create a new plane out here. And I'll show you how to do that. So I'm going to sketch on the right plane. And I'll go normal to it. And I can snap a circle right onto this corner here. And then we'll give it a dimension of uh, one and a half. Okay, so you can see that it's actually out in space, not really anywhere near where we want to extrude it. But that's okay, I can go right to the extrude command, and right up in the top of the extrude command there is a from, and uh, I can pull that down to say vertex. That's saying where do you want to extrude from? It defaults to, to the sketch plane, but in this case I don't want it to extrude from here, I want it to extrude from here. So I can pick that vertex, and you can see that the extrusion actually starts at that vertex, and I can say go five millimeters. Okay. Now it's interesting when I pattern this because the regular pattern command is trying to recreate the sketch and recreate the feature. Because I extruded from a vertex, the pattern is a little bit uh, screwy. So what I can do is pick this edge and say I want to pattern it this way and uh, flip the direction. We'll say 56 millimeters and we just want two of them. And you notice I don't see the preview. It's because it's it's offsetting it to the vertex and then extruding it again so uh, it's not really able to pattern it that way but if I turn on geometry pattern then it says just copy that shape over here don't try to recreate the sketch and re-extrude it with the same end conditions and same offset uh, just pattern it with uh, geometry only so that's what uh, geometry pattern helps with here. Uh, geometry pattern also usually helps the the uh, rebuild time uh, because it's not trying to recreate the feature, it's just copying the shape which rebuilds faster. So anytime you can use geometry pattern, it's highly recommended. There's a few times where it will just tell you uh, geometry pattern isn't suitable and you just turn it off. But uh, if you can turn it on, you'll usually see faster rebuild times. Now the next step was to create a little uh, screw hole up on top. Two places here that need to be uh, bolted onto the base plate on the bottom of the helicopter. So what I did was created a library feature. I'm just going to open that for you real quick and, and explain a little bit how I created it. So I created a feature that basically was the shape on top of uh, a rectangle. So if I roll back, I have a rectangle, then a cylinder boss extrude, then a filleted bottom side here, then a couple of holes cut in. Now the uh, this first boss extrude here you can see that it's centered by drawing two lines uh, that are coincident to this edge or not, I mean a single construction line that both endpoints are coincident to these edges here and then there's a distance off the origin. All the other features are related to that boss extrude too. Uh, you can also see that there is an L feature or an L on the uh, the boss extrude down. Uh, but the first boss extrude does not have an L. It's a little easier to see if I roll back where everything turns gray. You can see these have L's, but the first one doesn't. Everything with an L is going to be copied in to the new part when I drag this feature in. I don't need the rectangle, but I do need all the other features. This feature is not required, but it needs to be there to create cuts and extrudes on top of. So this is where the library feature starts, so it's going to bring in that cylinder, that fillet, and the two cuts. Okay, And uh, basically what you would do is create the shape and then uh, drag and drop it into your library. Just pin it down and then uh, drag and drop onto your library. Actually you would uh, pick uh, the features, I believe. You'd, you'd actually select these features and drag and drop them into your library. Um, if not, there's also an add to library command if you if you can't find the way to do it. I can't remember exactly what I did. 
because it's been a while now. Um, but you, I believe you just drag and drop the features into the library, and then it creates this feature. And it gives you the add to library feature when you drag and drop it in. So you can give it a name and things like that if you need to. Okay. So on this mounting boss now, if I drag and drop that feature into my new part, it just needs to drop onto a sketch plane. Once it picks the sketch plane, it gives me a preview and says, okay, there was a, there was a relationship to this edge. What edge do you want to be related to in your new part? So I pick a similar edge over here. And then it says, okay, there's also another edge down here that it's related to. Let's use that side. And then there is a dimension to a point right here that was the origin. So I'm going to use the origin of this part. But you could use any vertex that you wanted to to create that dimension from. So I'll place that, and then uh, I have the dimension that is the distance of it specified as a locating dimension. And I forgot to point that out, so let me open the library feature again and show you what I mean by that. So in the library feature, whenever you create a library feature, it creates these folders for the dimensions. And you can, you can expand the dimension folder, and you see that there's a, one called locating dimensions. So before I put this dimension in locating dimensions, it was just in this list of dimensions. And then I drag and dropped it into locating dimensions, so when I use this feature, it will show up in that locating dimensions field. So if I uh, edit this feature, you'll see right here, this was the locating dimension. So anything that I know I'm going to have to change every time, I can drag that into locating dimensions to make it easy to make those changes. If it's an angle of rotation or a positional dimension, you can drop that into locating dimensions. Okay. Then I had a little supporting rib here. This is a weak spot here, so we wanted to strengthen that up. So I'm going to add a plane that's just uh, normal to this edge and through that midpoint. So just by picking an edge and point, it assumes perpendicular and coincident, which is what I want. And then I'll just pick the plane, start a sketch. I'll look normal to it. And I'm going to draw the top line of the rib, or in this case, the bottom line of it, because it's going upwards. So let's say this is 20 degrees, and then 2.5 right here. So now I can double click to exit the sketch and I have put rib on my shortcut toolbar uh, but it's also up here on your feature manager right here. So I'm going to use it for my shortcut toolbar. Um, you notice that ribs can go parallel to the sketch or normal to. Uh, extrudes can only go normal to but the rib has the option for parallel. In this case it will be parallel. So I'm going to say let's do a thinner 0.75 so we don't get a sink mark on the other side and turn on draft so this can pull out of a mold okay. So it creates that uh, rib. Now I want to copy that all to the other side. Uh, so I'm going to use the mirror command. We use the right plane as the mirror plane and then the features to mirror will be the library feature and the rib. And then we'll go to uh, a mirror again, and we'll mirror around this face. And we're going to switch, instead of features and faces to mirror, we're going to go to bodies, so we can just mirror this entire shape. Okay, So that is our landing gear. Uh, I know that there's a lot of other things that I would have to add, a couple of rounded corners if I was actually going to injection mold this. But uh, this was really what we wanted to show, is just how to build that shape, some of the new features that 2013 gives us with the very pattern, um, a reminder of, of the fact that you can just move a face to rotate things out. Uh, your extrudes don't have to happen from the sketch plane. They can happen from, an ex from a vertex or another surface or another plane or just an offset from the plane. Uh, also remind you to take advantage of library features. Anything that you uh, create on a regular basis, uh, create those library features. Um, use them over and over again. Uh, save you some time so you're not recreating and uh, uh, not reusing your work, you know. Uh, so this has been uh, some tips and tricks on creating a, a landing gear for a toy helicopter. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, my name is Matt Morgan with Go Engineer. Thanks for watching.